Now I, I want to talk to you about um, our work. Six million years in 15 minutes, so I'm having to cut it down a little bit. <laughs> we, um, we work in Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. As you see, it's on the Rift Valley. And that's the reason that we have, A, first of all, so many sediments, and B, so many fossils, because the rift is still moving. And that movement means that there's always a basin there and there's always water moving into the basin and, and burying whatever's there. So this whole process of burial, erosion, formation of fossils and the exposure of fossils is going on today the way it has for so many years. So I'm going to talk to you basically about a recent find that we made, because as I say, I can't talk about six million years, um, and how this fits into the work that we've done um, over the years. Most people think that we dig holes, and everyone's always asking, what are you digging at the moment? In actual fact, we don't dig very much. Most of our time is spent walking on the surface. And we have an amazing um, crew of, of local people who can pick up pretty much any fragment of bone and tell you what it is, which part of the body, and what animal it comes from. And they are really skilled, and they really know what they're doing. But this is what they see as they walk along. And it's just rocks, and rocks, and more rocks. <laughs> and then, if they're really lucky, they'll see a fossil. How many of you can see that fossil in the middle of the picture? Just to help you. So it's not easy. <laughs> and it's really easy to miss them. And then when you've found a fossil like this, that's not the end of it, because you then have to spend a lot of time taking all the stones off the surface of the area where the fossil is found, putting it through a sieve, and then checking everything that's in the sieve for more, more pieces of bone and, and hopefully more pieces of the fossil you've found. And so at the end of that process, you have a, an area that looks much like this, where all the surface, so rock and everything has come, um, gone through the sieve, and we've hopefully found a lot more pieces. This actual site is a site of a specimen that we found in 1972. So this discovery that we found in 1972, um, this was the year that Louise was born, actually. She was, at that time, a, a tiny baby of two or three months. She first went to Turkana when she was six weeks old, and so she has it in her blood, I guess. Um, and you can see at that age, she's still interested in, she's already interested <laughs> in what um, her father's doing there. And what happened on this particular site was somebody found some um, skull fragments eroding out of the top of the slope. And over the next um, six or seven weeks, we screened the surface. So I used to spend my mornings out working with the team. And when this, this, um, these fragments came back, Richard thought, well, I could get to stick this together. And he sat there for three days and tried really hard. And I was sitting there, I want to get my hands on that, because I love jigsaw puzzles. And at the end of three days, he just got up and went and said, you do it. So I spent the next six weeks in the afternoons with Louise sitting in a bowl of water and me trying to reconstruct all these pieces that were coming in every day. And um, gradually it all came together and, and we had this fantastic skull. And it really is a, um, a, a, a fantastic um, specimen in that. This was now 72, so we, we at that point hadn't really found so much. We didn't have that much to compare it with or to f a picture to fit it into. And here we had this skull that was clearly a much larger brain than anything that came before. It's much bigger than an ape, but nowhere near as large as a modern human. It has this amazing, um, rather flat face. And so the question was, what is it? It didn't seem to be quite like the things that we were finding at Old Divide, but, but it's, it was clearly human with that big brain. Really, the last 40 years, I've wanted to find something that I could say, OK, they go together. And um, it's just remained this sort of enigma. We didn't know what it was or, or um, how it fitted in with everything else. In the following... Um, 30 years or so, up until 1989, we found a number of these skulls. These, these are the group of um, what they call robust australopithecines, which have enormous teeth and huge muscles and big chomping jaws, and they're very distinctive, so there's no confusion with those. These are all Homo erectus, 
Um, and that skeleton you see on the left was one we found in the mid 80s. And um, the other two skulls, a bigger brain than 1470, but um, and a body plan just like ours. Um, and th Homo erectus was the first uh, human to move out of Africa. So that's a very important species. And then these other things, which are generally termed Homo habilis after the species that um, Lewis Leakey named at Olduvai in 1960. And then there's 1470. 1470 is the catalogue number for this specimen, and it's given by the museum, KNMER 1470, which means Kenya National Museum East Rudolph, because Rudolph was the old name for the lake. And 1470 is the number of specimens that we got to when that thing was found. Um, and so this is, again, with all these things, still, what is it? And as I say, this, is, this question has bugged us for a long, long time. In 1998, um, uh, Louise joined me as co-leader of the expedition. And that year, she was, um, she was finding data for her PhD great asset to me because she sees she flies an aeroplane and <laughs> when you're working in this remote area getting up there takes you several days on on the road and um, so if you have an aeroplane it only takes you a few hours and it makes a big difference she had actually joined me several times um, in the past just to help me with expeditions and um, she we had a number of flights when she was an early pilot which i prefer not to remember <laughs> And um, in, so in 1998, um, she said, OK, let's work on the west side of the lake, because she wanted to collect data of her PhD, and I wanted to work on this site called Lomekwi. And so we teamed up and worked there. And my um, idea was, and hers as well, to find an early representative of the, of the human lineage that was living at the same time as Lucy. You've probably all heard of Lucy. It's a species that was found in Ethiopia and it's known as Australopithecus afarensis, and it's, it was at the time considered the uh, earliest um, ancestor of everything that followed. And so um, we spent two years there, and like everything that you do in these things, when you find your best find, it's always the last week of your last season. <laughs> and we decided after two years, we'd found some isolated teeth, but nothing really much. And so we, the last week we were saying, oh, look, we've worked here all this time. We haven't found that much in terms of human evolution. Found lots of animals, of course. And so um, here we are. We're going to pack up next week and start talking about going home. And then this thing turns up. And as you can see, it's horrible. It was a real disappointment in that. You can see it's really cracked and it's um, distorted. And it was a nightmare to extract, I have to tell you. So I spent a day or so getting it out of the ground and then took it back to camp to try and reconstruct um, all these pieces. And you can see there's a lot of them. And here it is looking a little bit like a skull, but not very. Well, we have an amazing preparator who works with us who cleans all the rock off the bone, and he spent the next six months trying to make this thing um, into something presentable and something that you could study and compare with things. And um, at the end of that time, we had this. Now, the great thing about this is that it clearly isn't Australopithecus afarensis. It's clearly not the same species as Lucy, but it is the same age. It's three and a half million years. And what do you see about it? This is a, a, an extra fragment on the left there, which is the same thing, but a different individual. And what you notice about it is that it has this very flat, long face, just like 1470. It has long, uh, forwardly placed cheekbones um, and this very, very um, straight profile. And for me, it makes a perfect ancestor for 1470, if 1470 proves to be an, a, a, a separate species. So we still have to answer that question. So this, I think, was a big step forward in that we named it a new species and a new genus, and um, it, it makes a very suitable ancestor for 1470. So then at the end of um, 1999, after we had gone back with um, Kenyanthropus, we decided to move back to the east side of the lake and we found all these um, specimens. But until 2008, we didn't find anything that we could possibly say was 1470. We found lots of other things, and this is me and Louise having a lot of fun um, excavating another hominid skull, but there was nothing that we could say was really 1470. And then in, in 2009, Daniel Elgite, one of our field crew, found this lump of rock with a couple of teeth showing in it. And so we um, took this one out of the ground, and this is what we had. And I bet none of you can tell me anything about that. 
this is um, actually these are the um, root sockets for the teeth, and this is you can see here just the the nose is here. It's um, we're hoping that we'd find the eyes and more things in there, but. When um, Christopher Chiari again spent some time cleaning it, and after that he had cleaned it, this is what we had. Now, the exciting thing about this is that uh, this is the front view, and you can see um, it's a long face. You can see the cheekbones are forwardly positioned, and you can see in side view, it has this very long, straight profile. And it has also some teeth and a, a very square front. So it was clearly, this actually does go with 1470. So for me, this was the most amazing find and I, I got absolutely ecstatic because finally we had something that would go with this one um, enigmatic skull that we'd found in 1972. And then the following year, um, after we'd, we'd matched these two and found that they went together, the following year, another of our field crew, um, Cyprian Niete, found a piece of lower jaw and it was coming out of this very steep slope. Um, I don't know how he even climbed up to the top of it because I never succeeded. And um, here's a piece of the, mand the mandible that you see there. Can you see it? So um, again, very hard to find, but he found it. And then we screened that whole slope, and there in the middle of this is another um, specimen here with um, the incisors and the side of the other side of the jaw. And then uh, during that screening, we found more and more pieces until we had this amazing mandible. This is the lower jaw of the most complete lower jaw known of an early homo. Um, and it tells, it has teeth and it has a number of features that mean that it can only go with 1470. So again, Christopher Chiari does his magic on the preparation and here this side view, left and right, and the front view and the teeth. And then we, the following year, we found another little bit of um, another mandible which looks similar. Um, and so then we started to study, and Fred Spore, who works with us, did CT scans um, so that we could see how the, the inside anatomy as well as the outside anatomy. And doing that, you can mirror image the missing parts. And so there we have now the most complete mandible of any early homo that's known. And it really is a fantastic specimen. So. Um, We've um, compared that with, with many other mandibles and with um, 1470, and the, the shape of the mandible exactly fits 1470. You can see it has this really upright um, ascending ramus here. It would normally articulate with the skull. The condyles that go in the, under the ear are right at the top there. And the, in order to articulate with that forward face of 1470, you have to have very upright, um, uh, the, the ascending ramus has to be very upright there. So, um, so we're really ecstatic, I have to say, because now we have, we know what the teeth of 1470 liked, we know what the mandible is like, we know what the, the, the face isn't a one-off, it really did look like that. And um, I think we can definitely say now that we have at least two species of Homo living alongside Homo erectus. And this is no longer something that people can say, well, maybe it's not real, maybe it's not a real species, maybe it's just on the outside. Um, range of, of um, variation. So just to um, wind up, um, I think every explorer now is, is um, one of the, the things they, did, they do is work with the local communities. You cannot work without involving the local communities in what you do. And so um, Louise and I were talking for a long time about building a research center from which we could operate and which others could operate. And then when Richard um, left his job with the government in um, in 2006 or whenever it was, we thought, let's get him before he gets into something else. And so we persuaded him to join us and, and try and develop and run, raise funds to develop um, a research institute on the left, on the um, east side of the lake. So he said, no, 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 I'm going to do two. I'm going to do one on the east and one on the west because it's very difficult to cross the lake. And it's going to be a, a, a real center for research in the Turkana Basin, and not just prehistory research, but all sorts of research. And so um, we've been raising money, and he's been the builder, the fundraiser, and everything else. And we now have these two institutes that are functioning. Um, the one on the west is, is completed, the construction's completed, and it's fully working. And the one on the east is in a construction phase at the moment. So, um, so that's our, our idea for the future, and um, this is the completed um, institute on the 
west side of the lake. So we have accommodation for researchers, for students. We run two field schools now um, every year, 10 week full semester field schools. And we have this big lab in the middle here for um, the artifacts and things which now will stay there rather than going back to Nairobi. So um, just to say thank you to the National Geographic, and I'm really that it isn't due thanks to the National Geographic, Geographic Society that we as a family have done all that we have and that prehistory in general is where it is. I think that they got an enormous applause for that. And to our field crew, if we'd had no field crew, we wouldn't have any fossils. They are the, the really the, the core of our, the heart of our work. Um, and if you want to know more, you can get links from the Geographic website, but also from our own turkanabasin.org. Thank you very much. Thank you.